Hello, and welcome to our program on issues of importance to the caucuses. I'm Dr. Joanne Lasoski, author and journalism educator. Joining us today is Paul A. Goebel, American analyst and ex with expertise on Russia. He served as special advisor on Soviet issues to the former Secretary of State, James Baker. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Thank you for having me. Last week's talks between the U.S. president's team and the Russian counterparts turned pretty tense. President Biden also told ABC News he characterized Vladimir Putin as a killer. Then there was a sharp response from Putin on this. And there was also talk of a cold shoulder given by President Biden as he withdrew from a live broadcast discussion with Putin. Um, might this cold shoulder turn into another Cold War? Well, those we've had not terribly good relations with Russia for the last dozen years, uh, ever since the Russian side invaded Georgia, and then it invaded Ukraine, and then it annexed uh, Crimea illegally. And it has done, it has killed, uh, Vladimir Putin has killed or tried to kill his political opponents. He has tried to isolate Russia from the West. He has done more to isolate Russia from the West than any Western sanctions. Um, if we're moving into something that resembles a Cold War, it's being done by the Kremlin, not by the West. Um, there are lots of people in Washington and other Western capitals who very much would like a more open relationship with Moscow. Um, so if we're moving in that direction, let's be very clear. It wasn't Biden's agreement with the statement that Putin is a murderer. He was simply agreeing with what almost everyone knows to be true, including those in Russia who know better than to say it in public, given what will happen to you if you do. Um, we have not done the kind of massive uh, sanctions that the Russians talk about all the time. Uh, have we done some? Yes. Have they had some effect? Yes. Uh, but the kind of isolation that we see coming out of Russia is self-isolation. It's being done far more by the Russian government than by the West. That doesn't mean that things will stay that way. If Mr. Putin decides to engage in aggression against another one of his neighbors, especially if it would be one of the three Baltic countries, which are members of NATO and the European Union, then I think you would have a much colder relationship than you have right now. And I think the West would take far stronger action than it has. But right now, what we see is a West that's horrified by what Mr. Putin is doing. Um, but it is Mr. Putin who is trying to is or isolate his country, not the West. So how do you regard the Kremlin reaction calling back its ambassador from D.C.? Is that an appropriate response for being called a killer? It's a public relations stunt. It's an effort to suggest, since they've never done that before, uh, not in Tsarist times, not in Soviet times, and not before in post-Soviet times. It's a fairly dramatic step. It's not that uncommon for countries to pull their ambassador for consultation to signal they're not thrilled with something set, been said or done. Um, and Mr. Putin is a dictator. Uh, what's said about him, he thinks he can run the, he can run the government as if it was about the country as a whole. Uh, I think what should be clear from what's going on is that the United States is increasingly making a distinction between Vladimir Putin and Russia that there are lots of things in Russia and lots of people in Russia we want to be co cooperative with, we want to support. Uh, Alexei uh, Navalny, for example, the man that Putin tried to poison and then has confined to a prison camp on trumped up charges, uh, is someone the United States has spoken out in favor of. Pulling your ambassador is a 24-hour media story. Uh, it doesn't have the grand significance that Russia has tried to invest it with because Russia is trying to make make the United States look as if it's to blame. Uh, we're not. Um, 
Would I have advised the president if I'd been asked to agree with the statement that Putin is a murderer? Well, I would have preferred that we not say it quite like that. I would say that Putin has presided over a murderous regime, something that would have been a little less personal, because once you personalize things, people will tend never to forget it, and it will make it that much harder and lead to that many more demands that somehow we make concessions in order to get the relationship started again. Those kinds of things have already started since uh, President Biden made his remark. And so it's usually best not to say anything that dramatic. Rarely has it happened. The fact that it's true is not, a, uh, is not, uh, not an issue. The question is the diplomacy of it. Uh, but pulling your ambassador, as the Russians have done, uh, is a public relations stunt designed to make it appear that somehow the United States has caused all these problems. We haven't invaded a neighboring country. We haven't tried to poison the political opponents of anyone in office. Uh, it just hasn't happened. And the idea that there's some kind of moral equivalency between ourselves and the Russians uh, on these things is just nonsense and needs to be, that needs to be said. Thank you, Paul. So just yesterday, the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee heard from George Kent, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, about bolstering democracy in Georgia, which is another hot spot right now. Um, he suggested a move away from the Russian three plus three deal because it gives too much power to the three larger countries and might underserve the caucuses. He is more in favor of the OSCE approaches to shared interests. What was he getting at here? Well, one of the problems when you form subgroupings of states is that the process of forming those those groupings and the people who the countries that are on them uh, tends to preclude change in certain direction. I think what uh, George Kent is trying to talk about is the need for a broader range of participants in the process rather than narrowing it down as Russia has tried to do. Uh, there are lots of countries with interests in Georgia. Uh, they're not limited to the six that uh, the Russians have sort of insisted on because that gives them a much bigger voice, just as the Minsk group gives Russia a much bigger voice on Karabakh than it should have. There are lots of countries. I mean, clearly, Turkey should be a participant in any discussion on Azerbaijan, and the Minsk group excludes Turkey. I would, I personally think that Iran needs to be consulted in some way with respect to Karabakh as well. But again, they're excluded. So I think what George Kent is talking about is the need to uh, open up the process, to not limit it. And I think that uh, that reflects a somewhat fundamental change in the American approach in recent years, where we've tended to fall into the trap set by the Russians, it should be said, of assuming that small groupings are the best way forward. And that plays to the Russian understanding that these countries don't make choices for themselves. Uh, those choices are made by other people. And so uh, having lots of other countries involved gives any country that's being discussed far more freedom of action. And that's what I think uh, George Kent was pushing, is promoting. Well, it's very interesting that the um, U.S. Senate is having these hearings on Georgia and the difficulties and problems that are happening there. Is that showing some kind of, um, do you think there will be any kind of motion from the U.S. government in, to do some kind of protectorate against Russia in Georgia? Is that possible? Well, we have, we have talked about as a government over the last uh, dozen years of a fast track approach to getting Georgia into the Western Alliance, either as a full member or as a favored outsider. Um, there are many people who would like to see Georgia taken into NATO. I'm one of them. I suggested or I argued in 2008 that when Russia invaded Georgia and, and seized Abkhazia and South Ossetia, 
that the United States should have taken the lead in a unilateral offer of NATO membership to send a signal to the Russians that what they were doing was going to get them in big trouble. We didn't do that. I made the same argument in 2014 when Russia invaded the Donbass and Crimea, uh, a unilateral uh, offer of NATO membership to Ukraine. Uh, the, the, the NATO alliance has always been about several things. But first and foremost, from the point of view of the countries in your, Europe, it's been a defense against those countries that are aggressive. And the only country that falls into that category happens to be Russia, whether it was the Soviet Union or now. The other reason, of course, for NATO, and I'm so pleased to see uh, the new administration stress NATO as an institution, is that Americans tend to forget that NATO is the only integument, the only structure we have that links the United States to the most important countries in the world, as far as we're concerned, which is the European market. People obsess these days about China, um, given its size. But the fact is the European market is a vastly more important one, both in terms of what it produces and what it consumes. And Europe is, for better or worse, uh, the place from which the United States sprung. So it's important that that main relationship be maintained, but also to be extended. And I think that uh, these hearings in the Senate are part of an effort to move that process forward. I think there are lots of people who feel that NATO can be reinvigorated by taking on new challenges rather than trying to avoid that. Thank you, Paul. Um, the, let's turn a little bit now to Armenia and the Armenian elections. The Prime Minister Pashinyan announced new elections for June 20th. Are, do you have any predictions on these elections? And I guess the big question is, has Moscow given up on Pashinyan? Well, Moscow didn't, never liked Pashinyan. They were opposed to his becoming Prime Minister. They saw his rise to power as a threat uh, to their interests in the region. Uh, given that he made very clear that he wasn't going to take orders from the Kremlin and that he wanted closer relations with the United States and, and West European countries. Uh, so they've never liked him. It's not that they've given up on him, that they that this, this has been since the beginning. The problem one needs to face in these elections is that no one in Armenia has the kind of support necessary to build a broad gauge coalition uh, to elect a majority party in the parliament. Uh, the military, which wanted Pashinyan out, uh, clearly doesn't have enough support. It's, it, it lost the war on the ground. It lacks the force at home to, play, to placate things. I think you will see more nationalist, more nationalist rhetoric. On the other hand, I think uh, the cooler heads in Yerevan recognize that Armenia lacks the resources to restart the conflict with Azerbaijan. That if uh, if Armenia were to try, then I think Azerbaijan would re would uh, complete the retaking of all of its territory uh, in Karabakh. So I don't I don't know. I can imagine that we will get a parliament. And this is a parliamentary system, which doesn't have a majority for anybody and that that will create a problem for some weeks of trying to put together some kind of coalition which will be in my view more nationalist in rhetoric but not necessarily more nationalist in action and that will also i think be uh more inclined to uh, cooperate with moscow than pashinyan has been up to now especially since there hasn't been yet the kind of moves by Western countries, France in the first instance, but the United States as well, that might have served as a way to wean uh, Armenia further away from Russian influence. So you sp spoke of cooler heads and it sounds like the, there may be cooler heads around as a result of the Second Karabakh War. Um, it sound, I've heard that Prime Minister Pashinyan spoke favorably for the first time about Azerbaijan. 
and opening the borders and regional cooperation has also been me mentioned by President Aliyev. Um, could this mean a warming up of relations? Well, it's going to take a very long time before we're going to be talking about warm relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And they're just, there's too, there are too many issues and too much emotion that's too freighted a relationship. On the other hand, there can be step-by-step -step moves, confidence building measures. And I think that uh, Pashinyan's remark reflects some of the cooler heads I mentioned in Yerevan who recognize that in the new reality, Armenia has very little choice but to try to work out new relationships with Baku and also with Ankara or find itself so isolated that its policies will be run from Moscow. And I think that uh, Armenians don't want that either. I think they feel they were betrayed uh, by the Kremlin in the recent conflict, which did not intervene early on as it might have if it had taken, if it had viewed Armenia as its first and most important ally. I've never thought that that the Armenians could trust Moscow, but Armenians always hope that they can. Um, I think R Moscow's goal, first, last, and always, is to have influence in Baku. But that doesn't mean that it's going to throw away all the levers of influence it has elsewhere in the region. So on the other hand, um, I understand today the separatists regime in Karabakh adopted Russian as a, its official language. What does that mean for Azerbaijan? Well, first off, there is no official, there is no uh, official government of uh, calling itself Artsakh, the Republic of Artsakh. That doesn't exist. Uh, two thirds of its territory was taken back by Azerbaijani forces in the fighting which ended in November. Uh, the, this round of fighting, I don't believe the war is over. Uh, the fact that uh, they made it an official language does only one thing, really. Uh, it will make Moscow happy because it will mean that official documents with which the Russian so-called peacekeeping contingent has to deal will be available in Russian and not just in Armenian. Uh, it's a it's a requirement now that those documents be available, government decisions or, or actions by officials claiming to be a government in what was called Artsakh uh, will be available in Russian. That isn't all uh, a, a huge problem. It's also true, and this is something that people have forgotten. Many of the Armenians who moved from uh, Azerbaijan, both in the early early and mid nineties, and since then, <clears throat> don't speak uh, Armenian very well. They speak Russian. Their children may learn Armenian when they go back to Karabakh or into Armenia proper, but many many Armenians, uh, while they are ethnically sensitive to being Armenians don't know, don't speak Armenian as a, as really their first language. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're trying to make sure that you integrate the Armenians who are coming back to Karabakh, the older generation in many cases <clears throat> doesn't speak Armenian well, and they will be, <clears throat> they will be beneficiaries as well. I don't think this is nearly as important a step as uh, a lot of people are saying. I, th I don't think it's going to uh, change the situation. Now, if Moscow tries to create a Transdenestria in the remaining part of our, what was called Artsakh, uh, Azerbaijan's Karabakh, a sub part of the Karabakh region, uh, obviously, this would be something they would build on, but by itself, it isn't necessarily uh, all that fateful, at least in the short term. So uh, it's been confirmed by Sokar that Russia will deliver gas to Armenia through Azerbaijan. The decision is not being viewed very favorably in Azerbaijan. Um, who gains from this deal? 
Well, and is it too soon to do these kinds of relationships? Well, the, 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 the problem we have is this. There is no peace settlement. There is no peace agreement. What there is are two declarations, one in November and one in January, that talk about these goals. There's no description of exactly what those entail. There's no description of exactly what reopening the transport uh, routes mean. There's no specification of exactly what Russian troops in uh, Karabakh will be doing. Uh, these are all open questions. Now, there are two ways that you can move forward. One is by very, very intensive negotiations that try to give specific content to all those things. Some of that's going on in these working groups, but those working groups, by all reports, are not, not making brilliant progress. The other way you do it, and it, it's in relationship to uh, these negotiations, are confidence building measures. Clearly, supplying gas uh, to Armenia can be a confidence building measure. In other words, it can be something that the Armenians will look to and that Arme Azerbaijan could say, you see, we're willing to cooperate, we're willing to uh, work with you, and therefore you should work with us. So I understand that uh, no one in Azerbaijan really wants to do much for Armenia until a lot further down the pike. But having said that, I think, uh, again, cooler heads in Baku understand that doing things like this can help you in that negotiation process. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about Turkey. I know you, you're not an expert, but the, it does sort of speak to the Russian influence. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken and Turkey still differ on whether Turkey should have purchased those weapons from Russia. Will this purchase cause serious rift between Turkey and its NATO allies? Well, uh, NATO countries prefer that NATO weapon systems be interoperable and that they are purchased from other NATO countries that produce them. The United States is the largest arms exporter within NATO, clearly has an interest that weapons be purchased from it. The world is a complicated place. Turkey uh, had many more asp aspirations from NATO membership than it has achieved. Uh, many people believed in Ankara that being a member of NATO would open the way for being a member of the European Union, the two things always being discussed together. That didn't happen. And so Turkey wants to demonstrate that it is independent, it, it can behave on its own, and it's done that in a variety of ways. The purchase of weapons from uh, Moscow is just one more thing. Is it an irritant? Yes. Is it a deal killer? Probably not. Uh, first off, we have to wait and see just how many Russian weapons are in fact delivered. Um, uh, the usual pattern in these things is that Russia announces a huge agreement about weapons deliveries, and then the weapons deliveries, if they happen at all, are much smaller in size. So um, this is this I think we should see as a diplomatic negotiation rather than a done deal. That doesn't mean that Turkey won't have any Russian weapons. But one of the things we learned in the um, Azerbaijani-Armenian fighting is that the Russian weapon systems in the main aren't very good. They can get better weapon systems from Israel or the United States, and that's what they're going to do. So I, again, I think too, too much is being made of this right now from my point of view, and that um, I believe Turkey will remain within the alliance. And I think to the extent that the alliance shows itself more active in the Caucasus and Central Asian direction, which has certainly been what the signals coming out of Washington over the last six weeks have been, um, I think Turkey will be more interested in cooperating with NATO. Does that mean it won't ever do things NATO doesn't like? Not on your life. There are a whole bunch of NATO countries that have done things that other NATO countries don't like, and we don't talk about the end of the world. I don't think we should be talking about the end of the world if Turkey does something as well. So we see Russia and Turkey trying to work together, but is it 
possible? And this is my last question, that Turkey's NATO membership is making cooperation with Russia more difficult. They've tried to work together in Karabakh and Syria. Is NATO causing tension between Turkey and Russia? Well, NATO exists, among other things, to keep the Russians out of from invading other countries. That's why we created it. That's why it continues to exist. That's why there's still interest, because unfortunately, um, uh, Mr. Putin last week referred to all the countries surrounding Russia as quasi-state formations, which is hardly uh, positive language about your neighbors. Um, because Turkey is a member of NATO, it has certain restrictions on its freedom of action. It ignores those on occasion, but it can't forever. I personally believe that Russia and Turkey have fundamentally different uh, interests on a whole variety of th things, including in the Caucasus. Um, if Turkey got its way, if Turkey was able to project power on the ground through Nakhichevan, across Zengizur, into Azerbaijan, and then across the Caspian into, into the four Turkic countries of Central Asia. That would effectively block Russia's long-standing plan to move south to the Indian Ocean through Iran. So at the end of the day, the geopolitics of the situation are such that I don't think we should be talking about NATO blocking any progress in this conversation, but rather the fact that Turkey and Russia have fundamentally different goals and that uh, that doesn't mean they can't cooperate on anything. But the expectation that this cooperation will be broad and deep, I think, is misplaced. Well, thank you, Paul A. Goebel, expert on Russia and other things. We really appreciate your insights. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, and we will be talking to you again soon, I hope. Thank you very much. Thanks.